Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. And today, we're going to be talking about extending your life with one of the world's experts in anti-aging, and honestly, in my opinion, a genius in agile thinking, which you know is my sweet spot. In fact, this person put the term biohacking in Webster's Dictionary and on the map. You're going to learn who Dave Asprey of Bulletproof is and why you're going to want to run, not walk, to get all of his books and buy some of his cool stuff. I just finished reading Superhuman, which is what this show is about. And honestly, it's one of the best books that's come across my desk in years. And he's written the Bulletproof book, The Bulletproof Diet, Headstrong, Game Changers, and now we're talking about Superhuman. And I believe this is one of the best books to come out in years and that all of us should go get this book. I've met him in person. I feel like Dave Asprey is an authentic person. You know, a lot of people who are big in the world aren't necessarily walking their talk. Not all famous people do, but he does. And you're going to learn what is biohacking and how you might use it to live longer, maybe be older, but feel like you did in your 20s, and how to use nutrients. And we're going to dive into some questions about off-label use of medications, which I'm pretty excited that I read about in his book, and how to turn on your brain mitochondria and healing power so that your lysosomes can clear out aging gunk in your cells. You're going to learn what a lysosome is and why and what you should care about it. And you know, they always say that there's two inevitable things that you can never, ever, ever get away from. Taxes and death. So we all think death is inevitable, but what if it's possible through technology to make death or putting off it to a long, long, longer time, say, like Dave Asprey says in his aspirations to be 180 years old, What if you could put off death, but be very healthy, know everything that you've learned and spent your lifetime and have some rupees in the bank and do? So Dave Asprey gave us this new idea that aging is plastic. It's encoded. And if something is encoded, you can crack that code. And if you can crack that code, you can hack that code. So we have on the show today, the dude of biohacking. It's not just for the CEOs of Google or the ultra rich If you read Superhuman, you see how Dave Asprey has made this available for you and me. And believe me, by next year, 2020, it's the first time that there'll be more people on earth over the age of 65 than under the age of five. So we need biohacking. We need this information that Dave put in this book. I try and live my life by this. I really do. I try and every day make decisions that make me younger, longer. So welcome to the show, Mr. Bulletproof, Dave Asprey. I'm really happy to be on and thanks for having me. Thank you for being on the show. Well, how in the world did you bump into biohacking and make all this start? I used to weigh 300 pounds in my mid-20s. I had the diseases of aging before I was 30. I had arthritis in my knees since I was 14. I had high risk of stroke and heart attack on lab tests and cognitive dysfunction, the stuff you'd expect in your 60s or 70s, not in your 20s. And doctors couldn't seem to figure it out. I worked in Silicon Valley. In fact, I'm the first person to sell anything over the internet, the very first e-commerce. No, really? Good. Yeah. What did you sell? It was, was a t-shirt. First- T shirt said caffeine, my drug of choice, and had a picture of trimethyl xanthine, the caffeine molecule on it. And I was an entrepreneur magazine and size double extra large t shirt, you know, kind of red puffy face. When was and, that? Uh, circa 1993. I have a copy wow. of it floating around here in there somewhere. So cool. And the name e commerce didn't exist. And it, right, they're like, right, right. you can sell on the inner what? And, <laughs> and uh, sadly, Two weeks after the article came out, the first spam hit the internet and the people who wrote the first spam read what I was doing in that magazine. And I warned about this. I said, don't advertise. That's not how it's it's for. It's for communities. And there you go. And by the way, it was attorneys who are the first spammers. So a little bit of internet history there. Who would would have thought that's how it actually all worked? So during that time, I said, if I can hack the internet stuff, uh, maybe I can hack myself because I don't like how I feel. I don't like where things are headed. And 
I started hanging out with people three times my age at a local anti-aging nonprofit group. And soon I became president of it. And I developed a fascination with cognitive enhancement because my brain didn't work half the time. And I worked in Silicon Valley, the, the company that held Google's first servers when it was two guys in a server. I was a co-founder of that company. And I was a part of that company. And so I, I'm seeing all this and saying, I, I want to be here. I want to be present for it. And it was that merging of those things. So when I, after a long time of frustration of saying, you know, no one over 60 will come to this anti-aging group. Why? You know, we're four minutes from Google's headquarters. No one will come unless they're old. And it's really hard to reverse aging, but possible. It's pretty easy to prevent it or to stave it off. And so I wanted people who are in their 30s and 40s to come. And eventually, I decided, okay, I've done all the medical stuff I can think of, all the stuff that's supposed to work. I've tried working out six days a week, hour and a half a day for 18 months, eating a low-fat, low-calorie diet during that time. Still weigh 300 pounds. And now I'm strong and fat and tired. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's really frustrating. And you sort of feel like, okay, I ate too much lettuce. That's clearly the problem. It's me. It's a moral <laughs> failing. And I decided to go to Tibet and learn meditation from the masters. And I started doing the personal development side of things because as an engineer, that stuff shouldn't work. But hey, I'm out of, I'm out of ideas here. What could work? And over there, I had yak butter tea at 18,000 feet elevation. And that became the inspiration for Bulletproof Coffee because it made me feel good in a way that, frankly, putting yak butter in tea should not. And it was that, what, how could that be possible? That question came. And then... That became I, like the seed for your brain octane yeah, oil. Yeah, for brain right? octane oil you, and you the recipe. You sent me some and I uh, was trying it. And boy, once you do that, you don't want to eat the rest of the day. It's completely satisfying. It, it's ridiculous. You put a, a couple of teaspoons of this oil in your coffee or tea or in your smoothie or just pour it on your sushi or on your salad. It doesn't really matter. It works best blended, but it, it, you Why do does that. Why it work all best blended? This drove me nuts. Okay. I'm a sane engineer. So I come back and say, oh, well, if putting butter in tea or in coffee works, I should be able to eat a stick of butter and drink some coffee and it would be just fine. It doesn't work. It has to be emulsified. So I went uh, through I and I did e okay. extensive research on this. Is it because it forms micelles, these tiny little droplets of fat that repel water? And is it because of something else? And after funding research at the University of Washington uh, with Dr. Gerald Pollack, I, I feel really confident saying that when you blend certainly butter and likely brain octane oil in liquid, particularly hot liquid, it makes something called exclusion zone water. And this is the water that your cells use inside them. When you drink normal water, your body heats it up, makes infrared light, that's heat, <laughs> changes the water from what we call bulk water into exclusion zone water that has a different consistency than normal water. It's actually the fourth phase of water. And all biology requires that. And that's why if you drink plant juice or any kind of juice, that comes out of in coconut water, or whatever, it feels different. It's not just the sugar in there. It's the structure of the water. And this isn't, you know, structured water because you prayed over it. This is the structure of water because it's a phase of water that changed because of a specific input. And when you blend it, it works. When you blend it with the presence of polyphenols, the colored compounds into your coffee, it works. The Tibetans figured this out 5,000 years ago. They couldn't tell you it was polyphenols, but that's why they make yak butter tea the way they do. Because when you when you drink that, you can use it to make energy right away. You don't have to convert it first. So you were not feeling great at all. You were not getting answers from allopathic medicine. You went out to Tibet. You had yak butter in tea that mm -hmm. had methylxanthine, similar to coffee, caffeinated polyphenols. And you felt so much better that you decided to create a product that was similar to that, which was the seed of all this. And how did you come with the name Bulletproof, which is such a dynamic name. You ask anybody, and they know Bulletproof. How did you come up with that? I wanted to feel like Superman. It's that straightforward. I wanted to know I have more energy than it takes to handle anything life brings me. And I didn't have that. I was just, I was like a driver in a car and have the accelerator all the way down and the car slowing down and I can push harder, but there's nothing left. And a lot of people feel that way right now. And I just, I got really tired of that. So I said, all right, I want to create things that I can't buy, things that radically improve how you feel. So Bulletproof Coffee Beans are lab tested for toxins in coffee that make you jittery and anxious and tired and are bad for you. Because we have a problem with toxins in coffee. It's not that coffee's bad for you. Coffee's actually great for you, according to tons of studies right, now. Right, about a thousand polyphenol plant beneficial compounds. Yeah, it's, it's become a real superfood just in the last 10 years, even after I started the company, the research just comes out and out and out. And 
It turns out, though, that this blend of butter and brain octane, and brain octane is better and different than MCT oil, which is better than coconut oil for this specific requirement. It took uh, probably a thousand iterations and playing around with all the things you could use. It's coconut oil, coconut milk, all these things. And I kind of laugh because you see some knockoff stuff out on the market today and it doesn't taste very good, but it has coffee with mold in it. And it they're using something that's called MCT oil, but it's a different length of oil than what I use. And then you wonder where people drink it and they get disaster pants from it, which is what happens when you get MCT, what I call street grade MCT. So there's there's just so much real chemistry and precision that goes into making something that provides more returns for someone who uses it than it costs them. And I feel like I've hit the bar there, but it was just born out of self-interest. I didn't like my brain not working. I didn't like being hungry all the time and I didn't like being fat. I'm 10.1% body fat. I'm so never 10. hungry. 10.1% body yeah. fat right now? That's As a really former obese amazing. person. Yeah. That's I, mean, I, was, I don't know what my percentage was back then, but I lost a hundred pounds of fat. And I, I have size 33 inch pants. I was size 46 when I was a freshman in college. I mean, it's, it's such a difference, but I don't have fat pants in the back of my closet. You know, I, I used to have that. Oh, I know I'm probably going to gain weight back. So I need to be able to, you know, rotate my pant size and all that. It, it's gone. This is how big I am. This is how I feel. And it, it's not effortful to do this. And if there's nothing worth eating at a restaurant because it's all deep fried, whatever, I just don't eat. And I'm totally fine. Or eat one of my collagen bars, and I that I'm going to die if I don't eat thing. It's gone. I don't have that. Well, anymore. I love that. You know, you took a look at 500 people that were really successful and looked at what they did that made themselves so much better. And I love that you say that biohacking's always been around. Isaac Newton, Paracelsus, even you say the ancient Greeks were biohackers. That this quest for living better. So, how did you? come up with this whole idea of biohacking and how did you huh. extend it beyond the coffee and what did you find in those 500 people? I, I was in uh, Tibet and I was journaling and I was trying to come up with a name for this because I recognize bodybuilders. Oh my God, they know so much. I don't necessarily want to get that big, but I've certainly been in the gym. But how come they know how to lose fat? But the doctors don't seem to know. How, they just tell me, maybe you should eat healthy. I'm like, what, does, what does that even mean? You know, <laughs> Give me some instructions here. So I realized they weren't talking. And then I talked to Navy SEALs and professional athletes. I want to be the fastest. I want to be the deepest diver or the astronauts. You know, I want to be able to survive space and gravity and high stresses. And I realized the uniting element for what they had and what I had, I wanted my brain to work so I could keep getting paid in Silicon Valley and just so I could feel good. It's control of our biology. And what hackers do, and I am a computer hacker by training, that, that was my career. Our job is to take control of stuff, whether it's our stuff or someone else's stuff. <laughs> we take control and you can you control something. Conquer some, entropy, conquer yeah. entropy. <laughs> and, and you don't have to understand everything. And, and this is a major thing. When we had explorers, you, we have Lewis and Clark, like, we don't know what's over there, but we'll just go over there and see what happens. And if they come back, then another group of people come through and they explore and then they make maps and then they civilize it. And what's missing from human biology is that exploration, saying, okay, what, what's, what am I capable of doing? How do I reach my goals? And my goals might be different than yours, but the tool set's the same. And then, okay, now we've shown it can be done. Now someone is doing it. Now how do we feed that information back to academia so they can do some, some deep research and maybe figure out why it works? But I can tell you, I knew unequivocally that if I blended butter in my coffee with brain octane oil, that I didn't get hungry, I lost weight no matter how much I ate, and my brain worked like I, I was begging for it to work as a young man. And now that is valid scientific observation, you know, that first step of observe. Is it just one hypothesis. cup in the morning or do you do several cups? What, I, what I do dosage? one, like about a 12 ounce cup of coffee in the morning. And then I used to do another one or two because I was rebuilding my cell membranes. And I was, I was like the, the stuff of life. So I usually do a cup of black, or sorry, a cup of bulletproof coffee made with brain octane in the morning and my beans. Then at lunch, I will put brain octane in my food and I'll probably have a shot of espresso like I just drank at the beginning of the interview. Um, and then I might do a decaf tonight and I'll have brain octane in my food tonight. So I'm, I have ketones all the time because brain octane turns into ketones. Right, even but, if, you're, if you're eating some carbs, it still helps your body create ketones. Is that You accurate? can pour brain octane on a donut and eat it, and you'll have more ketones than if you had an important brain octane. That, that's extraordinary. And this it was, converts. you worked really hard to do this, create this. Yeah. 
it converts directly into a bioidentical ketones. And what I found is if I have a pound of sushi, including rice the night before, you're not going to be in ketosis the next morning. I put brain octane in my bulletproof coffee. I blend it up and I stick a ketone meter on my finger. I'll get to 0.5, which is a magic number for ketosis. So what does ketones do for you? Tell people that are listening that don't know why they would want to drink um, your brain octane oil and get ketones. Why? So the ketogenic diet is the number two query on Google this year. People are all over this stuff. But what ketones do is, is kind of magic in the body. You can burn sugar, which is what we're designed to do, or glucose. And that's what we do most of the time. You can get energy that way. However, in times of fasting or famine uh, or just lack of carbohydrate, we call that winter <laughs> throughout human history. Um, what would happen is your body would switch over and burn fat and it would use up your fat reserves. And when you burn fat, fat has more energy in it than sugar does. There's more calories in a gram of fat than in a gram of sugar. Well, calories are a unit of energy. So if you're burning stuff that's high octane, that's why I call it brain octane oil, uh -huh. uh, it wouldn't be surprising that your neurons would really prefer that because they needed more electrons than they could get from glucose. They'll do what they can. But the reason you do ketones or the reason you want ketosis is that your brain works. Your neurons will choose that fuel source even if there's sugar present. And because when ketone levels rise just a little bit, not like the keto bros, you know, man, if you eat one gram of carbs, you're a bad person. That whole thing is, that's a fad that's going away. Uh, but having ketones present some of the time for men and women, especially as we age, ketones appear to have beneficial effects on Alzheimer's disease, on cancer. And what they do when you get those levels up a little bit is they turn off a hunger hormone, uh, actually two hunger hormones. Uh, one is called uh, ghrelin, which makes you hungry. And so when you get that 0.48, which is a very low grade ketosis, enough that most people can get there with just brain octane oil in enough quantity in their food, but not coconut oil and not most commercial MCT oils. Uh, you do that. And then all of a sudden you find you're not hungry the way you were. And that's because your craving hormone just got turned off. And at about the same level, there's another hormone called CCK. I, I like to think Calvin Klein made that one. Cholecystokinin, uh, right? Exactly. And that hormone makes you feel full. And ketones will give you that too. And they have other anti-inflammatory benefits in the body that are really, uh, really profound. So if you put that stuff in your coffee, oh wait, there's something else interesting. The amount of caffeine in two small cups of coffee doubles ketone production in the morning. So the morning, there's a synergy between yeah, the high octane Absolutely. Oil? Okay. And we didn't have any of that science published when I came out with Bulletproof Coffee. It was from I the figured yak it out. experience into yeah. bed and then you sized yeah. it. I took the wisdom of the ancients, <laughs> tried it out, experimented, made it work, and then the studies came out that said, so oh, this does work. So I've got a question work. for you. So you have a comment in your book, and I went and looked at the study. I went and looked at a bunch of the studies because I thought some of them were really interesting, the comments you were making. Thank you. And you said it was that um, poly plant oils can turn down the thyroid that polyunsaturated oils can mm -hmm. turn down the thyroid. So I went to this guy's, it was like a Turkish, in fact, the abstract was in another language, but yep. at least the body of the article was in English. I was grateful for that. And he was saying that polyunsaturated oils turn down the function of the thyroid, including fish oil. Can you comment on that? And this has been a longstanding debate. And there's a small group of people out there who say, any unsaturated fats, um, not most of them aren't too worried about monounsaturated, but the polyunsaturated fats, which means any plant oil. Does uh, that mean olive oil? Yes. Olive oil, though, has more uh, poly or has more monounsaturated, but it contains some polyunsaturated. So, what these people believe is that any amount of that is going to be bad for you because it'll turn down thyroid function and harm your metabolism. I don't believe that the preponderance of evidence supports that point. However, I the sent point, the article over to Alan Gavey. I haven't heard back yeah. from him yet, but I was, would you please tell me what your thoughts on this? And I'll send them to you when I get them. But I, I was I'm really interested. interested in this article. <laughs> so so I, I have tried doing no fish oil and no polyunsaturates at all. And yeah. the problem is that we know unequivocally what um, EPA, particularly, there's two predominant omega 3s, there's EPA and DHA, that your body really benefits from. And the just, brain is made up of so much yeah. of that. And for I fertility? Mean, there's so much art, art, articles on that about the efficacy on your nervous system and your brain and your cell membranes. And one of the reasons that uh, women with a little bit of uh, junk in the trunk, <laughs> patting on the thighs are attractive to men 
is because women store DHA essential fat there. And the first baby that a woman has will exhaust her stores of DHA for the baby's brain. And when we're young, we need more DHA. And as we age, we need more EPA. But people say, oh, I'm getting my omega-3s from plants because I'm bad at science. The (laughs) omega-3s from plants convert at a ratio of 45 to 1 into those oils in the body. And it's biologically difficult. But said that fish oil turned down the thyroid. Yeah, There, there are studies that say that's the case. However, just because the doses we're talking about two, three grams of fish oil may slow thyroid function. If you're doing everything else right, it probably isn't going to slow it so much that it's a problem. It's and the, the benefits, yeah, the, the benefits picture. of them are profound enough that I I prefer to take phosphorylated uh, omega three oils. I make something called um, Bulletproof Omega three, and we put a cool word after it. And I'm forgetting what the Bulletproof Omega three is. Omega three force krill oil. Maybe it's krill oil forgetting its name right now. But what it has is krill oil because krill oil is tied to phospholipids that make it go into the brain better. So I believe that the preponderance of evidence says don't eat polyunsaturated oils except some fish oil. And the reason for that is in So you don't eat olive oil? I'll eat some olive oil. In fact, there's great evidence for olive oil being good for you. That's, there's a lot of positive evidence of olive oil yeah. being an anti-cancer and on and on. Yeah. Uh, however, with olive oil, I'll you want to get real olive oil. You don't want to have oxidized olive oil. And you want uh, want that because it has monounsaturated fats in it. It has some polyunsaturates, but not too many compared to any of the other plant oil types of things that people think are healthy. So I will add olive oil to things, but I'll also- What olive oil do you use? Sorry to interrupt you, but I want to know. (laughs) Oh, I get single estate olive oil picked by monks in Greece. And I'm, I'm an olive oil snob, so I couldn't tell you one specific brand. I have a friend who- goes around and finds the good stuff and sends it to me. I'm pretty fortunate that way. Oh, I want to be introduced. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm actually going to be sending an introduction out on uh, on my website, the daveasprey.com, uh, my personal blog around the books and things. Uh, yeah, I'll follow, sign up for that list. And I will, um, okay. when, when he's ready for an introduction, I'll, I'll send it out. And what you end up with is with good quality olive oil, you get some great polyphenols. But here's what I do the rest of the time. There's a compound called hydroxytyrosol, which is the primary antioxidant in there. I take hydroxytyrosol, which is giving me something like 500 times the special effects of olive oil, and I can get it in a little capsule. So, so what's I do the that. name of that capsule, and do you make it, or where do you get it? I don't it? make it. Hydroxytyrosol. Uh-huh. Uh, you can just buy it online, wherever hydroxytyrosol is sold. <laughs> I, don't even, I can't even tell you what brand I use. You always <laughs> have new things. So, how, um, so you take one a day, two a day? What do you Usually do? one a day. Yeah, almost no one knows about that stuff. That, that's just that an example. That's so interesting, Dave. That's what I love compounds. about you. You have, you have a vision. You know, you, what you do is you rise above the paradigm of worldview vision and you see things brand new. And that is absolutely cool. I just wish You're the worldview was accurate. by that which has been. Well, you are always trying to figure out what's accurate. But my question also to you is, you say in Superhuman that your goal is to live to be 180. You say the longest yeah, verified at person. Least, at, at least, least 180. So I want you to talk on. about this. The, the, right. You say the longest verified person verified to have lived and died was 122 and someone unverified, which I'd like to know where these two people were from, was a 140-year-old person. So how did you get to at least 180? And is this real? Do you really think that you're going to possibly achieve this? I think I'm actually being conservative. (laughs) 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 So I just didn't want to sound too crazy. So I thought 180 was a good number. And I came out with it like this. I know we can do a buck 20 because I see it. 120, it's done. Okay. Let's go back 120 years. The year is 1900. Henry Ford has not started yet. There's no cars. Okay. World War I hasn't happened yet. And when it does happen, it'll be fought on horseback. <laughs> okay. There's no antibiotics. We don't know how bacteria work. We don't have public sanitation. We're worried about our children dying of polio and other childhood diseases. In fact, you might as well have at least five or six kids because you know two of them aren't going to make it. Those people are still alive today. They couldn't spell DNA because it hadn't been invented. I mean, like it, it was a different world. There was no microwaves. There was no radio. There was no TV. The telegraph changed the world. Can you imagine? Look what the railroads did. 
They can let us finally ship things back and forth across the country. I know. And people get pissed off if their cell phone doesn't work up in an airplane yeah. up in the sky. What the heck? Yeah, We've they, come a long way, baby. <laughs> they saw the Zeppelin catch on fire and explode. It's, it's mind boggling. Mind boggling. Okay. Mind boggling. That's looking backwards. Now, for me to write Superhuman, if I had to do it 30 years ago, even if all of the research existed, I would have had to go to a university library. I would have had to live there for two years and I would have used a technology called Microfish uh, where you actually have the research things that are shrunk down on these little tiny... That's how I got my birth records to find out my yeah. DES daughter. I had to go get the Microfish film that right before they shredded it all. It was so long ago. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is how we stored things because the paper was too big. So they would just shrink it down like a photocopier on a transparent sheet of paper where you could shrink it down a lot and you'd, you'd scroll through these little things with a magnifying machine. It's so stupid, except it was amazing back then. But from our perspective now, in the back of my office here, I have the world's basically hard drive from 1885. It's uh, the card catalog that won the award for the best filing system in North America. <laughs> <laughs> this was like the, the most wealthy companies would buy so they could have an advantage in accessing information. So I could write Superhuman because I could access research from Turkey in five minutes. And you could find that same research because I referenced it in the book. That advantage combined with machine learning and artificial intelligence, by the way, my uh, concentration in my uh, undergrad degree is in artificial intelligence, something called decision support systems. I studied this stuff. It's all happening. So now you look at the next 120 years, uh, whatever World War III looks like, I can guarantee you it's not going to be on horseback. <laughs> uh, in fact, you might not even know what's happening. It might all be done at the genetic level. Uh, if, if we can avoid it, that would be better. But whatever is going on here, I believe that if we don't run out of topsoil, which we have about 60 years left, if we keep spraying glyphosate on it and doing dumb things to animals in feedlots, uh, things like that. But if we don't run into massive problems there, it's pretty much inevitable that people who are alive today will live in the hundreds of years. And I just did a podcast with Liz Parrish where we talk about uh, gene therapy. I'm actually going to sign up for two gene therapies uh, coming up here where I'll be able to modify things I wrote about in so what Superhuman. Exactly, what exactly is gene therapy? It's not stem cell therapy. It's and I've, therapy. I, there's a lot of stuff about stem cell therapy that I put in the book because I went and I did all the stem cell therapies so I could write about them and so I could live a long time. Um, gene therapy is you take a harmless virus that 80% of people already have. A lot of people don't, don't know, but a huge amount of human DNA came from viruses that became a part of our DNA. So it's not as scary as it sounds. And they well, use the virus. The, we have positive viruses in our microbiome. They just yeah. haven't been really uh, studied yet. But viruses are positive, many of them. Not they're not all bad. Right. Yeah, they're not all bad. Just like bacteria aren't all bad. This, right. this microbiome right. might matter, right? So. What they do is they do that and they put some specific uh, information on the outside of the virus. They inject the virus where you, they want it to go in the body. And then those genes get taken up by our system and you get different genes. So I'll do the genes that uh, tell my body that I'm exercising you when I'm not, <laughs> which have all sorts of effects. So this on... is definitely the definition of designer genes. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it turns out I write about uh, two compounds in the book that do that, that you take externally. The, the, it's called PGC1-alpha. Low-dose oral nicotine, not smoking. Smoking will kill you. It's bad. It, it's gross too. But low-dose oral nicotine reverses Alzheimer's disease and upregulates PGC1-alpha. That's why uh, people love to smoke because it turns on the brain so much. It's just that it has the downstream adverse yeah. events and you're avoiding that by taking it orally. You said about a milligram a day? Yeah. You turn, if you're, I'll just do it right now. Where do you get that? A milligram of nicotine Check a day. This out. That's I'll oral. spray some under my tongue. I <sighs> wish you could do it through cyberspace. I'm going to open my mouth and have no. It would smear the lens. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a product that's only in Canada and Europe. It's not approved in the U.S. yet. What's in the, the U.S., it? um, it's actually Nicorette, but it's their spray. The lozenges that they make are have bad artificial sweetener and things in them. So the cleanest source of nicotine in the U.S. is a company called Lucy Gum. I think they're chewlucy.co, but L-U-C-Y, L-U-C-Y nicotine gum, just Google that. And I'm not saying get addicted to nicotine. I'm saying an oral dose has been shown to reverse Alzheimer's disease in clinical trials since 1988. 
And I interviewed uh, Dr. Nicotine, I call him, the researcher from <laughs> Vanderbilt University, yeah. who has been publishing this research for 30 years. But because nicotine equals tobacco equals evil, people don't look at it. Well, Bredesen, look, he's at the University of California mm -hmm. reversing Alzheimer's disease, not using nicotine, and no one wants yeah. to listen to him because he's not using medication. Oh, he hit the New York Times list. He came on my show. I helped him do it. He's a, he's a friend and a total total workhorse and just a knowledgeable guy. And you have Maria Shriver's Women's Alzheimer's Project because women get Alzheimer's more than, than men do. Um, last year, um, I was the largest individual supporter of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, the, the nonprofit, uh, by donating time at 40 Years of Zen and making donations for book signings and all that because I really believe in what she's doing there and say, hey, this is actually, it's a problem for all of us, but it unfairly hits women. I think part of the reason I just want to make a comment is there's 100 million women on birth control pills and birth control <laughs> pills turn off your hormones. Man. I, I was looking through your book. You mentioned them on 156. I was going, when is he going to mention hormones? And you did. And you mentioned them beautifully, but hormones rule your brain. And a lot of wow. women on birth control pills, there's studies now to show that even though you were on them when you were younger, your hormones are down regulated even when you're older and off of them. One of the things that just makes me so happy is there are memes in biohacking and I've done very consciously, I've been developing the ability to have a microphone to help direct our national conversation around what matters. And my first book was on fertility. My wife was infertile when I met her and we put together our knowledge of 1300 references took five years to write the book on how do you have healthier, uh, healthier babies we do before and during pregnancy. And it's how we made her fertile again. And she's a medical doctor who now consults with people on fertility. And so I, I've known about these problems for a long time and the research comes out, but the world's ready to hear stuff at a certain time. So you're the fifth person in the past two weeks who mentioned that without me prompting you uh, on a podcast. Uh, we, I just did a couple specific ones. Uh, one was with, uh, was it Sarah Hill? Uh, Liz Parrish just mentioned it. Uh, and I just talked very heavily uh, with Dr. Mansoor from the DNA company. And they have a new genetic test that they're coming out with that can help you see how hormones affect you. But everyone knows now, uh, like, okay, everyone does know, but everyone will know in 2020 that the birth control pill changes women's brains, not for the better, it, for it the worse. It reduces the size, size yeah. of the hippocampus. It came out this week by 6%. It reduces yeah. the size of the hippocampus. And they think that change is permanent, even when you go off the pill. Oh, come on, permanent, I permanent. Mean, that's, you know, you, if they're biohacking, they yeah. could reverse it. You can if reverse it. If they read that. your books and do your things, and what my things that we recommend, but not if they just go through life without doing any improvements. No, and, and it's actually really important to have reproductive freedom because it's a big deal. In fact, when the birth control pill came out, the number of women who felt like it was worth going for an advanced degree did it. Otherwise, if you go back 40 years, why would I want to do that? I know I'm just going to get pregnant in the middle and I won't be able to finish my degree and what's the trouble? Uh, and so now there's a lot more freedom that comes from it, but it turns out there's other methods of birth control that are very reliable and safe and don't break your brain. And, and there's, there's more to that as well that isn't in superhuman. There's the aging part of it. There's the cancer risk part of it and how hormones can be beneficial as you age. External hormones. I'm on testosterone. I have been since I was 26 because magically I had less testosterone and more estrogen than my mom when we compared labs when I was 26 because I was Your obese. Fat cells make estrogen. Yeah. Yeah, men, yeah, a lot of men today, there's a, a documented testosterone deficiency in American males. Part of it is obesity. There's a lot of other things too. You know what I'm blaming? And this is brand new thinking um, that, that no one has written about yet because it just came out in a recent episode. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's birth control pills fault. And here's why. Because if there is a woman who's ovulating in the room, men will make a lot more testosterone. In fact, we'll do all sorts of stupid things to get the attention of a woman who's ovulating and we won't even know why. <laughs> like it's not like most guys, oh, they just know, wow, that is a really attractive woman. I think I should start a company so I can impress her. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we do kind of dumb things, but it, it cranks up your testosterone. But if 85%, which is the current number of women, take these pills that reduce their pheromone levels, reduce their hormone levels, reduce the cycles, Guys are responsive to that as well, right? So we have this this whole kind of reduction of the the polarity uh, between men and women that happens when either one of them reduces their uh, their hormone levels. 
And so and I, I think- I'm just writing this oxytocin yeah. book and oxytocin is tamped down. All hormones are tamped down. So women can't read facial cues as well. They get jealous more. There's more issues within, um, they, they say it contributes possibly to an increased risk of divorce, which goes along with what you're saying. If you look at uh, that episode of Bulletproof Radio, it, it, I don't have a number for you because it's it hasn't even come out yet. Uh, but just look for birth control or or uh, the pill in Bulletproof Radio, and listen to that. Uh, I think this was uh, Sarah Hill, was it? Sarah Pre- Hill. Let me make sure that's who it was with. Okay. Um, I'll write this down. Yeah, and what we we go through in a lot of detail on this. It's right up your alley, and I think that your listeners would appreciate that interview as well. Because okay, everybody, so you're going to want to listen to this bulletproof yeah. podcast. One of the go to things, DaveAsprey.com and yeah. click on the podcast there. And one of the things that that came out of this interview was that when women are on a birth control pill, when they look at their mate, you know, their husband, their spouse, they will normally have a release in the brain of brain activity of a pleasure. Their pleasure centers get activated when they're on the pill looking at their mate, their partner has exactly the same brain electrical signals as looking at a stranger. Right. So I, I just feel like we've got to take care of our women and we've got to enable them to take care of themselves and having this knowledge that says, okay, it might be in my interest to to modify my hormones this way because I'm, I want to focus on my career and I'm okay with that. And I, I'm willing to take these risks now that they're disclosed to me. Or maybe I will just be really careful about my other forms of birth control that work very well, and I'll choose a different path. And it's, it's up to every person to decide what they want to do here. It's just that if you didn't get to decide because you started taking it when you were 12, because you had a couple uncomfortable periods, it's a massive society-level experiment that no one has done. And it is a part of aging. And you know, my book on, on superhuman is not meant for old people to read. Although the response from people who are over 60 has been, I didn't know I could do anything about this. I'm on it. It's that when people read it in their 20s and 30s, they say, well, if aging is death by a thousand cuts, maybe I could take less cuts. I could make them less deep. And if I did take a hit, I could heal it like Wolverine instead of just slapping a Band-Aid on it. And that is the path to living to at least 180. Because guys like George Church and uh, David Sinclair from Harvard I've interviewed David on the show a couple times, wrote a blurb for his book, Lifespan, that just came out also in the longevity and aging category. Uh, Fantastic book as well. And the idea there is when you get professors at major schools who are willing to put their tenure at risk and their reputation at risk by saying, we can now turn back biological aging in cells, in human cells, in a lab dish, and in mice. We can turn them back. We can make them younger. For the first time in my career of decades, I feel safe enough and confident enough to come up and wave a flag and say, we can do this. Meanwhile, 90% of people are sitting there going, this isn't possible. In fact, that can't be possible. Therefore, it isn't possible. And then they go on with their pizza, beer, french fry diets, wondering why they get old. And yeah, you change what you eat. You change your supplements. There are some other interventions, and I covered the vast universe of those. I did almost all of them (laughs) that I could. I couldn't do birth control pills and get off of them in the book, obviously. But superhuman is my path to go from being that fat person with cognitive dysfunction and autoimmunity to being someone who's 47. That's 26% in the way I'm counting my birthdays. But I... I have more energy now than I've ever had in my life. I've started multiple successful companies at the same time. Uh, there's a 40 years of Zen, the neuro- neuroscience company. There's Home Biotic, the company that makes a mold spray. It's a oh, probiotic yeah, you just spray sent me that. House. I can't wait to open that little it, box. That was it, a great thing. All that stuff, my glasses company, True Dark for Circadian Rhythms, it's all just stuff I couldn't buy. But how do you do that and be a New York Times author and a podcast with 150 million or so downloads, you know, top 500 on, on iTunes, and do it for years straight and be a dad? and a husband, you know, it turns out you can do it, but only if you make enough energy in your body, only if you've turned on this youthfulness stuff. I didn't have this in my 20s and 30s. Normally, you're supposed to have more energy back then and more wisdom as we age and less energy. What would happen if as we age, we maintained or grew our energy and we grew our wisdom at the same time? Would we change the world? And the whole point, the master point behind superhuman is that we have an epidemic where our old people who are supposed to be the source of knowledge In fact, a study just came out um, last week that said, we now have a biological reason for menopause because we found it in whales as well. And most animals, most mammals don't have it. 
Well, the reason that it happens is for wisdom. There's a biological advantage for older people to be able to pass their knowledge down to the newest generation. So the the Upanishads said that in India, mm -hmm. when I was a yogini studying, they would say you have, after you've given birth to your children, you're then supposed to be um, a householder tending to the community as an elder. It's not exactly yes. the same thing. And, and elder we, is exactly we, that. We denounce older women. We denounce older people. Uh, most older women feel invisible and devalued in our society, besides not feeling like they can contribute the wisdom that they have. So everything we're, you're saying is... We're going to fix that. Okay. It's, it's happening so right now. I'm so glad you're working on it. So glad. Look, I go out of my way to interview people over in their 80s and 90s. And I, uh, let's see, uh, Eric Kandel, the guy who discovered neuroplasticity and got a Nobel Prize for it, still, still working outside of uh, Central Park on Fifth Avenue somewhere there in New York at his, at his lab. And I've interviewed Stan Gruff, the guy who invented transpersonal psychology. And I didn't get to do Candace Purse, per, who discovered the opiate receptor because she just passed away uh, before I could do of? it. I didn't know she passed away. She did, unfortunately. She was young. Oh, no, she wasn't that young. She was oh. Uh, oh, I 70s, she was. I think. Oh, well, to me, that's young. Right, fair, <laughs> fair point. But she, you know, she was going to. I don't know that she made it in. I, I don't have to look. It might have even been 90s. She had a really long career. Really? Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to look. But well, one of the things I really want to know is the things that you do, and one of the top questions I have is about sleep because you mentioned. You know, the, I feel like the medical community gives us sleep guilt that if we don't get eight hours sleep, we're just going to fall apart and be a puddle of muscles and liquid bones, and you know, we're not going to be able to live. And you talked about this huge study that came out of the Keck School of Medicine at USC and the American Cancer Society where they took a look at almost a million people and how they lived. 1.2 million, yeah. 1.2 million and how they slept and their mortality rates. And you said that people that slept 6.5 hours, and when I went back and looked at the study, it was even five to six hours. Those people lived longer and the people that slept eight hours died earlier from all cause mortality. So can you talk about that a second? Because sure. people are going nuts about sleep guilt. So I've been saying this since the beginning of my blog, almost 10 years ago now. Like guys, we have a problem with our analysis on sleep. It's the same as when people say water shaming. You have to have eight glasses of water a day. Has anyone ever told you how big the glasses are? And there's no research on that at no, all. None no, whatsoever. none whatsoever. It's just one of these dumb things that people say. So eight hours a night, the data is really clear. The people live the longest, six and a half hours a night. Sleeping six hours a night is better for you than sleeping eight and a half hours a night, except that's a total lie. And here's why. Healthy people need less sleep. The better- I love that. Yeah. The better your body works, the better you are at pumping cerebral spinal fluid into your brain to do a brain wash. And I, I cited two studies in Headstrong, my book about the brain, that show, okay, that actually is driven by mitochondrial function. Right. Yeah. Right. So the lymphatic system is powered by mitochondria as you would expect it would be because all of us is. Uh, but that means if you can make your body better able to do that, you will get full recovery in less time. And if you're sick, everyone knows you need extra sleep when you're sick. But to force yourself to get eight hours of sleep is useless if you don't need it. And to cut back on sleep because you think it'll make you live longer is just dumb. But designing your life so that you wake up at six and a half hours and you feel rested and ready to go. And the way you do that is you measure your sleep. I'm wearing a ring that costs a few hundred bucks called the Aura Ring, O-U-R-A. And it measures sleep in a very accurate way. And I say that with some degree of certainty. I was CTO of the first wristband that could get heart rate from the wrist. Uh, Intel bought that company. This was uh, going back more than a decade. And I... I look at that and say, this ring is a miracle because I can wake up and I can say, how much of my time did I spend in deep sleep where I'm fixing my hormones and in REM sleep where I'm fixing my brain and I'm doing the memory consolidation, things like that. The and, deeper sleep is what gets you living longer. Yeah, it's those two states are the primary important ones. So there's a lot of times people say, God, I slept eight hours and I'm so tired. But you look at their data, they got five minutes of deep sleep and they got 10 minutes of REM sleep and the rest of it was light sleep or they're waking up and going back to sleep. So uh, for me, I went from being that person and I, I never particularly wanted to sleep because there's cool stuff to do, but my sleep quality was garbage. And so, yeah, I'd sleep five hours a night, but um, it was 
really not that big of a difference for eight hours because the quality wasn't there. So what are the, your top steps for us to okay. get that quality sleep? For me, uh, the there's two big, big things that changed it for me to the point that I can I got two hours of deep sleep on an airplane flying to London. I get my deep sleep every night. It's the color and intensity of light. So the company I started called True Dark that makes glasses that are designed for sleep. I put those on an hour before bed or after the sun goes down, ideally, I will get my deep sleep. Reliably, I'll get more than an hour and quite often two hours of deep sleep. How do they work? It turns out that people have heard of blue blocking glasses. Well, blue blocking glasses are not really a good idea because if you block all of the blue light that you get during the day, your body doesn't know what time it is. And the sun is mainly blue light though. That's what's confusing. The sun is full spectrum. It's the whole I rainbow. I just had this there. eye doctor on the show and that's yeah. what she said. So I'm going off that. I guess that's mm, not No, nah, she's wrong. Huh? Okay. Just flat out wrong. I mean, I, <laughs> co- I started a company. I have patents in the space on changing the frequency of light going into your eyes. You, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'd be happy to talk to her about it. But there is a ton of blue light in the sun. But it's, she's a mind share doc, by the way. So I'll put you two together. Oh, cool. Mind share, it, okay? There is blue in there. But as a ratio, uh-huh. no. The lights that are on right now in our monitors have five times more blue light as a percentage than sunlight does. Okay. So when you get that intense blue light from the sun, it's paired with infrared, red, yellow, the whole spectrum. And blue light will suppress melatonin at night, which you need for sleep. So people say, oh, I'll put on blue blockers before bed. I did that a dozen years ago as well. The problem is that blue is one of four colors that we now know affect the timing signal. There's little 5% of the cells in your eyes control timing, and they listen to more than just that, uh, just that color. So the true dark glasses designed for sleep, we filter out all four of the spectrums and we patented that. So now you put on these glasses, they're a reddish color, but it's not a red tint. It's layers of optical filters to cut this out. To cut Are this you gave out. me that as a gift too. I just opened it up and look at it. It comes in the neatest box ever. Oh, thank ever. you. Little I love thing. this box. Well, it's this, I love it. I opened it up and it was somewhat orgasmic, the feel of it. It was like, Aww. oh, this is so cool. And then even the glasses are packaged so that each stem of the glass has a little sleeve on it. It's very classy. I, I want I want them to be quality. It's easy to buy laboratory glasses for twelve bucks. They don't have the same frequencies, but they'll at least help somewhat. But it, you don't want to be seen in those. I wanted stuff that I can wear. I was in Las Vegas at a club wearing the red ones. They're called sunsets that are designed so you can still see my eyes, but it, they block the right light at the right angle. I still slept like crazy, even though I was out late at a club and people just thought I was a rapper or something or a rock star or a dork. I have no idea. I don't really care. <laughs> I slept. Well, you, my mom. <laughs> Lived to be 96. She didn't get ill dementia until the last few years. She was totally healthy, never complained she was tired. And she only slept four hours a night her entire life. She had so good this genes. Is my, this is yeah. my, well, I think I've got some of her genes myself, yeah. but um, you know, I was only slept four hours a night until I lost that kidney and you know, all the other things that happened to me when I was younger. We don't need to go over that. But um, so I really saw a person with boundless energy that slept four hours a night. So she obviously got really deep quality sleep that time, but I never could buy into. And when I traveled around the world, I saw indigenous societies where they would sleep for four hours, wake up at midnight and have some food, community, things going on and then go back to sleep. So I I never really bought into the idea that we knew that eight hours was exactly the deal. So I loved when you wrote about this, I thought this was huge. So just the idea of guilt over sleep, come on, there's other things to feel guilty about. Like feel guilty about eating industrial raised animals. Stop yes, doing that. Yes. By the way, I was a raw vegan for a while. That stuff will make you sick and old. Don't do that either. So there's oh, yeah, a, a, you put, talk yeah. about that. You have a chapter um, or a, a section on um, vegan is not the way to go. Not if you want to live a long time or you want hormones or you want to be fertile because our bodies use cholesterol to synthesize hormones. And I know this makes people mad and there's two camps. There's, I do it for, uh, for reasons around uh, animal cruelty and all. I live on an organic farm. We raise our own animals. And I will tell you, they're very happy animals and they would not exist if they weren't part of the life cycle. We're supposed to have animals, they're called buffalo, and they walk around and they fertilize and they keep the biome of the soil healthy. And they have elephants and other big herbivores in Africa. And they, they stop desertification. They're really important. And you cannot have your avocado vegan toast if you don't have animal shit, if you don't mind me saying that. They actually poop that is what vegans eat. They eat animal poop in the form of vegetables. 
And it doesn't work without that. So what's going on is we're strip mining to get nitrates to artificially inflate soil that's becoming depleted. What I do instead of my farms, I'm growing the soil because the sheep walk around and they poop. It's amazing how that works. They eat grass that I can't eat, that I don't have to irrigate, and then they make healthy soil that holds water that grows great vegetables. Dave, so this where do you live? Horrible. Where is your farm? My farm is on Vancouver Island. Oh, you're on Vancouver Island. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one of the beautiful oasises in the world. That's nice I'm, there. I'm very fortunate, but I will tell you that my house here is the median cost of a house in, uh, in San Francisco, and I have 32 acres. <laughs> so it's not that crazy uh, to live up here. You just have to be willing to, uh, to commute. You know, when I was a young girl and I came back from India after the Beatles had gone there to hang out with the Maharishi, I hung out with the Nearings and Elliot Coleman, and they started the organic farming, organic gardening movement. I don't know if you know Scott Nearing. and I don't know Scott, but it, it's, know. it's an important thing. Uh, when we look at our diet, the, the right diet to live a long time is a plate covered in vegetables, not grains. And covered in healthy, undamaged fats, at least 50% of them saturated because funny enough, 45% of your cell membranes in your body are saturated fats. Who would have thought? And I'm talking grass-fed butter, ghee, coconut oil, and healthy animal fat that isn't deep fried or anything like that. And then you want a good amount of monounsaturated. We talked about that earlier. A very small amount of omega six and some omega threes, but so avocado, put guacamole all over your, <laughs> all over your vegetables, and then have a small piece of grass fed or wild caught meat, and uh, two to four ounces. Most of us get too much protein, but by supporting healthy agriculture by eating those small amounts of meat, you'll save money or at least break even on eating industrial meat. You don't get the antibiotic residues, and you don't contribute to climate decline and soil decline which happens if you eat either one of those fake burgers made out of corn and potatoes and whatever, or whether you eat an industrially raised feedlot animal. So you got to take those out of your diet if you want to live a long time anyway. And if you don't take them out of your diet, you'll live a long time, you'll be in a world with no soil and that sucks. I've got That's a question cool. for you. So I discovered about a year and a half ago, a molecule that I refer to as a molecule of mass destruction. There are a number of them that drive disease, but this one's called, the acronym is TMAO for trimethylamine N-oxide. You write about it in your book, and you can develop it in response to meat if you have dysbiosis, or if you turn out like myself to be a DES daughter, it turns out that all DES offspring upregulate FMO3, the enzyme that makes it. So I've been in a confused state because I've gone off a lot of animal meat. I eat a small, tiny amount, like you're saying, and that has been life-changing for me because I was so high in TMAO when I measured it in my blood. Can you comment on TMAO? Sure. TMAO is something that's formed from choline, uh, which comes from uh, soy lecithin or from fish. It's actually very high from eating fish, much higher from fish than it is from red meat, but people don't often talk about right. that. And it comes from red meat only if you have bad bacteria in your gut. Or if you have this enzyme. This yes, regular. or if you have this enzyme. I don't know the percentage of people who have that enzyme, but I'm, my guess is that if your levels are that high, you actually have the bad gut bacteria and the enzyme. Well, I actually checked and I didn't okay. have you that. You didn't, okay. That was but, my next question. But there's all these articles coming out now that endocrine disruptors like dioxin and DDT and possibly many of the other ones that we haven't even tested yet, that this enzyme can be upregulated by endocrine disrupting compounds. If that's the case for you, it's totally okay to eat more butter. You're going to get a lot of the fat there. And then when you have the meat, have liver, <laughs> which is high in choline. But one of the things is if you get choline deficient, which is a major problem uh, in society right now, you'll get fatty liver disease. So you're going to have to get choline in your system anyway. It normally comes from egg yolks, liver. And as a vegetarian, all you can get it from sunflower lecithin, which is generally really good for you. But that'll convert as easily as meat. So it's not a meat issue. It, for most people, it's a gut bacteria issue and possibly a genetic issue. What, what's and the by, difference in your mind between choline and citicoline? Oh, totally different animals. There's forms of choline. There's citicoline, uh, CDP choline, and alpha glycerol phosphoryl choline or alpha GPC. Um, these raise choline levels in the brain higher, although I think alpha GPC has some downsides, so I'm a little skeptical on that one. I use uh, CDP choline in the smart uh, nootropic things that I make for Bulletproof. Well, that brings us to the point I would love for you to go over. You have a whole chapter. I mean, 
was great because reading Superhuman, so many of the things you recommend I do, like I used ozone to fit, help my eyes, et cetera. But you have a whole chapter of biohacking of medications to upregulate. You call it make us a human upgrade. And I'd love for you to talk about them. There were things, that, some of them that I'd never heard of or drugs that I heard of them only for their label use. So if you could mention like, I'm not even sure if I'm going to pronounce them right, like pyracetam. Pyracetam, is that uh, Paracetam, yeah. Paracetam, I completely bastardized that. That's okay. Okay. Uh, there are cognitive enhancing drugs, and I say drugs, these are made by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, some of them, and they've been around for 50 or 60 years, and they're just not recognized in the U.S. Uh, they're not illegal, but they aren't recognized in the physician's desk reference either, so they're sort of gray zone. And I've been on it for 20, some of them 25 years, totally changed my brain. They enhance oxygenation in the brain. They, uh, the one that I prefer, aniracetam, that I write about in the book, increases memory I.O., the ability to get things in and out of your memory, and it lowers stress. And so what would be the name of the prescription, and where would be it's the It's not even a prescription. You just buy it online. It's aniracetam, A-N-I-R-A-C-E-T-A-M, or just go to the daveasprey.com uh, website and search for nootropics, and I have blog posts where I've written about all these things. But that's one of those things where I think as we age, everyone should probably be on those. Those are very neutral. The side effect is they might amplify caffeine a little bit and they can use more of this choline for certain types of brains. What's so the you dosage might need that you some. use for that? It depends on your body weight and all. For aniracetam, it's usually about a, a gram, a thousand milligrams. And people take, take it and they say, wow, I didn't have to grasp for a word. I remember everything. It was, you know, it was pretty amazing. What about ProVigil, which is normally, I remember being in uh, Oklahoma uh, working at an integrative clinic and all the drug reps came in because there was this brand new drug for people that had really severe fatigue. But you talk about using this drug, um, which is really modafinil, for a brain enhancer. Could you discuss that? Absolutely. So I was on uh, modafinil when it, the studies first came out, or ProVigil is the other thing it's known as. Uh, because I, my brain just wasn't working because of autoimmunity, because I've been exposed to toxic mold. And I got a prescription for it. And you could tell the, the doctor I thought I was hitting him up to get Adderall or something because I was going to business school. And when he saw my brain scan from Daniel Amen, he just looked at me and he said, I don't even know you're standing here in front of me. Inside your brain is total chaos. I'll never forget those words. You have the best camouflage I've ever seen. And then I could act like I didn't have chaos in my brain. And he gave me some Modafinil. I took it every day for eight years. And it is the limitless drug from what's, Limitless, what's the, the movie. What's the dose of that? It really depends on your brain and your size, anywhere from 50 to 400 milligrams a day. And there's a couple analogs of it that are out now. And it is a prescription drug. Do you like the analogs better? Or do you like the original drug? I like the original better. I don't take it regularly because I don't really need to. Like my brain is, it operates beyond the levels I used to get from that oh, stuff. And I when think I take it, your brain is very sexy. I guess oh, I'm sapiosexual as the <laughs> Tinder explanations go. <laughs> There you go. Uh, it's it, my brain has always been pretty good, but it was much less able to to do what it can do today. I think being on modafinil for eight years trained me to be a certain way. But I also run a neuroscience institute. I spent four months of my life with the electrodes on my head, teaching my brain to do what I wanted it to do, to reach those advanced Zen states that normally take a lifetime. And modafinil, though, was a huge part of my path. I was on Nightline. The reason it became a big thing is that they did a ten minute segment. They came to my house, and I was the only guy who would talk about it without a bag on my head. And I took modafinil to get through Wharton. I would not have graduated without a smart drug like that. But it's not a life-extending brain health one, but it's one that might give you your brain back so that you have the energy to do the work to get healthy. I've got a patient that I have a question for. So she is a young girl. She was suddenly developed um, uh, autonomic dystonia. You know, she has POTS disease. Mm -hmm. And she's in a wheelchair. She's 17. And it turned out that the house that she was born she toxic in, mold. she had totally, to they, they went in and there was footage of toxic mold. The remediation yeah. company said it was the worst they've ever seen. But now, fast forward, she's been seeing all these top-notch functional doctors, many of them that go to Mindshare, really smart people, and she cannot get better. Would she be a candidate? My question, one of the things I promised her I would mm. ask all is right. if you thought any of these drugs, in, in particular ProVigil, would be okay or pertinent for so her I, situation. I am totally not a doctor. And I haven't looked know, at her, know, her stuff and all. But let me just give you some thoughts on that. I had POTS. This is the orthostatic hypotension. It is very commonly caused. When I hear that, I'm like, oh, you had mold in your house, didn't you? So common. It's probably not the only cause, but it's a big one. 
So what typically works for people like that is they could take fludrocortisol and dexamethasone. These are things that are cortisol analogs because they have low cortisol in the morning. You can use bioidentical cortisol four times a day if you want to at a dose of five milligrams. And heck yeah, have your bulletproof- We were bulletproof- talking about that this yeah. morning, actually. This Do is that. so synchronistic. So synchronistic. It's okay. Have okay. your bulletproof coffee in the morning because those ketones are going to feel pretty good. The coffee is also going to make you feel good. Uh, don't drink moldy coffee. That's going to be particularly important. You got to get the person out of the moldy and most environment. most coffee is moldy. Uh, especially in the U.S. because we have no legal standards for molten coffee, unlike China, Japan, all of Europe, and most of South America. So when coffee that gets rejected from those markets gets sent to us. I'm not making this up. Um, that's why Bulletproof Coffee is special, uh, the beans we make, uh, because I couldn't drink normal coffee. I quit coffee for five years because how it made me feel. Oh my so, God, I can't even imagine doing that. I would be uh, like, you're going to take my skin off and I'm going to go walk through the planet skinless. I could not do I barely, that. I barely remember those years. Uh, but uh, uh, I, would, I would look at doing that. I look at modafinil for quality of life issues. And um, then you have to look at the inflammatory molecules and heavy ozone therapy. But there's no reason that someone who's been exposed to mold cannot recover. And probably... 30 to 60 days of, of uh, rotating sporinox and fluconazole to get rid of mold in the tissues, as well as cholestyramine, activated She's been charcoal. on all of that stuff. She's but, been on all yeah. of that stuff, yeah. But yeah, it, it's tough, but the ozone therapy is, is a really She's big thing. She's not done that, and oh, I, I'm, I've been really trying thing. to, okay, yeah. 10 pass ozone and rectal ozone, that's what changed my brain from mold. And then the mitochondrial enhancers, I mean, look at keto prime, oh, so, look at unfair yeah. advantage. Can you Those summarize some of difference. your favorite mitochondrial? So mitochondria oh. are the energy uh, organelles mm-hmm. in our body, and, and you talk about how they really drive, the, your, your mitochondria drive your health, that there's what you have to attend to. So what are your favorite mitochondrial boosters? You know, my uh, my favorite boosters are uh, brain octane oil in the form of ketones. I'm like sold now. I really didn't understand till I read this book. I didn't get it. I, I didn't get the memo till late. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'm glad I had you on the show. <laughs> There's something called Keto Prime, which is a, a rare ketone that primes the pump for the mitochondrial uh, pump to work. Keto is that a Prime. product, a nutraceutical? It's a, it's a bulletproof product, yeah. Oh, and there's okay. one called Unfair Advantage, which is a liposomal form of PQQ and CoQ10. Those three things together, uh, oh, and try MitoSweet, the sweetener that we make. Uh, you get those three things together, you're, you should feel a pretty good kick. And on that note, I am over on this one. I've got people oh, waiting for me. On shoot, the I line. wanted to ask you about Depernil. Shoot. Uh, I'll have to read the book. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was so great having you on. You're one of my really favorite people. Thanks for all the work you do in the world. Maybe we all upgrade from all of your hard work. Well, I appreciate you sharing the wisdom. There's a lot of it out there. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Okay, Bye. bye.